Hey everyone, here I am in this little circle here. Do rising interest rates actually create inflation? Can rising interest rates be inflationary? This just concept just kind of blows our mind. But over the last few days, we've been looking at some stuff that would indicate it possibly can. That's how crazy the world is right now. So let's put uh, myself in the corner here and share some of these. We're recording this early December. What is the day today? Today is Thursday, December 8th is the day we're recording this. Some of the headlines that are just coming out are, are like this. Bank of Canada delivers a half point rate increase. If you're not aware, yesterday, the Bank of Canada came out and raised a rates half a point. Was it yesterday or the day before? Everything's a blur right now. But this week, the Bank of Canada did this, raised rates another half point. Here's what it looks like. The Canada's key overnight rate climbs to 4.25%. That is the bottom line on this chart. So you can see how low they've been. And now they're doing that steady incline that we've been seeing over the last year. The top line is Canada's annual inflation rate. The reported documented one, whether we all believe that that's the actual rate that affects our, our pocketbooks is another story, but that's the official inflation rate right there. The top line, the bottom line is Canada's um, overnight lending rate or their key interest rate. And this really decides a lot of variable rate mortgages. A lot of people who have variable rate mortgages are affected when this um, rate changes. And we're seeing headlines like this, mortgage rates to soar higher after the latest interest rate increase, but end of hiking cycle in sight. So some people are saying that the wording that the Bank of Canada used when they raised rates recently are kind of suggesting that perhaps we're at the end or near the end of a hiking cycle. This is important to give the economy and specifically the real estate market some clarity going forward. Let's see, I don't think any of us can really believe or trust what the Bank of Canada is telling us. You know, it was only, I feel like it was only, was it like 24 months ago when the Bank of Canada was telling us borrow, we're gonna keep rates low basically. I, it, it, it seemed like forever. Then they changed their mind and said, oops, you know, we have to make some hard choices. Inflation's out of control. Because of all the money we pumped into the economy, we, we actually have to raise rates. Sorry about that. So I'm not sure any of us really believe them anymore. But here's a, here's a, a, a paragraph from that article in the Financial Post. It says, the Bank of Canada is already seeing the rising rate environment's impact on mortgage holders. The central bank's recent data showed that about 50% a variable rate fixed payment mortgages and nearly 13% of the entire Canadian mortgage pool have already hit their trigger rate or the point where monthly mortgage payments are only covering interest and not making headway on the principal. This is obviously a big deal. If all of your payment is just, you know, going towards interest, you're paying down no equity on the mortgage. And for some people, the payment isn't even making all of the interest anymore. So this is when a trigger rate happens and different banks are handling it in different ways, but it's starting to be pretty serious. And I think this is the point where a lot of us believed we would see even more chaos in the markets than we currently are. And the reason I, I share that is the latest unemployment stats are still showing that employment in this country and Canada is still fairly strong. So these are all lagging indicators. So maybe over the next few months, we're really going to see unemployment kind of spike up, the rate spike up. But right now, I think this is giving cover for the Bank of Canada to do as it pleases. Inflation is still relatively high. Unemployment rate is still low. It kind of gives the Bank of Canada leeway to do whatever it sees uh, fit in the next little while. Something that Nick and I will always look at, this is the Canadian Bankers Association website. I left the URL in the top left-hand corner for you. You can go to this website and he, he see historic mortgage arrears numbers. And if you look on this, uh, the main page here, the latest reporting data is December 5th. They always lag. So the latest data is actually looking at data that ends September 30th. So it's not the most real time. It's not, it's another, you know, laggard in the data pool. And it, you know, it is showing some interesting stuff that in Ontario, the amount of mortgages in arrears are 0.06 and in Canada overall, it's 0.14. So just for historical context, our average, the last time I checked on this is about 0.9. So we are like multiples below our average. And in the U S during the great financial crisis, 2008, nine, 10 period, mortgage arrears hit eight, nine, 10%. So just for context, we are 0.14. So I really think we can see headlines in Canada over the next three months that say mortgage arrears in this country have tripled and it will still be at like point, you know, what would that be 0.42 or whatever that is? So they will be true. Those headlines will be true. 
but it'll still be below our long-term average. So it's something to kind of watch. And it doesn't mean it gets, it doesn't get much worse from there if rates stay high and even go higher, uh, higher for longer. But I, we kind of have to read between the lines when we see headlines that mortgage arrears might triple. So let's say in February, we see that that headline could be accurate, but at the same time, it could be accurate that it's still below historical averages and still relatively low compared to places like the U S. So you kind of have to read between the lines, but this is stuff that we're obviously paying attention to. And you can too, by just going to the Canadian bankers association, and you'll find the mortgage arrears, um, data there. So remember the house can never lose. And to me in the economy, the bank, the commercial banks, and the central bank is the house. They can never lose. So if people are hitting their trigger rates and mortgage payments aren't even covering interest and people are worried about mass defaults right across Canada and the US, that would cause a lot of losses for the banks. They don't want to take possession of properties. They're, they're not in the business of foreclosure, foreclosing or doing power of sale on properties. They don't really want that. So it's interesting to see this by Steve Soretsky who put this out from the UK. Check this out, some of these tweets. The banks have agreed to provide specific assistance to mortgage borrowers, such as extending loans or lowering monthly payments. UK's Chancellor Hunt, CEOs have reaffirmed their commitment to protecting mortgage holders. Banking CEOs reaffirmed their commitment to allowing customers to switch to new fixed rate mortgages without having to undergo a new affordability test. And I mean, how kind and generous it is of the banking sector, and I'm, I'm obviously being sarcastic, that they don't want mortgage holders to lose and they're willing to adjust the terms and allow things like lar longer you know, amortizations perhaps so that people just stay in debt longer, but they don't default. So they just keep paying the banks and they don't default. The bank doesn't want to take possession of the house. They just want the, the income to be coming into them. So to me, this is what I expect to see here in Canada, more and more discussion if things really start to get bad, where the banks, you know, are painted as being kind and flexible. I'm laughing because I just can't help myself here, but you know, kind and flexible that they're going to offer new terms and Canadians can have options to get out of um, payments where the trigger rates have been hit and their entire monthly payment is going towards interest. All these wonderful new things might be introduced to make sure that Canadians can keep their houses. And I mean, that's obviously a good thing. But it also means that the banks are likely going to be making even more money because as amortizations are, are, are increased, you know, you're just in debt for longer. So like the house can never lose. The banks are never going to lose. So, you know, I'm always suspicious when people say, oh my gosh, there's going to be just this massive real estate collapse. I'm like, really? The banks are going to allow that to happen? So just something to, to watch. Um, and here's the most interesting part. I and mean, this is really got what got us thinking this over the last week. Um, you know, we've all seen these headlines that the Bank of Canada is losing money. And part of the reason for that is that the interest rates have gone up so much that the excess reserves that the banks have on deposit at the bank, the payments that the Bank of Canada is having to make to the banks now because of higher interest rates is really getting out of control. And the Bank of Canada's earnings from bonds they've purchased in the past have much lower rates. So the spread between the lower rates of earning and the higher rates that they're paying out is making them lose money. And, you know, that's obviously interesting. And you see charts like this is, this is now the U.S. Fed and it's showing, you know, how much, mo how much money they're kind of losing that has to be paid out to the treasury. And, you know, it's obviously makes for like a stunning chart. And um, this is really what got us thinking, though. This is Luke Roman. You can follow him on Twitter. His last name is G-R-O-M-E-N. This is a paid newsletter and just a little segment that we wanted to share. So, you know, The Forest for the Trees, he puts out great stuff on YouTube, Twitter. Definitely recommend checking him out. But he had this in, in, a, in a newsletter that we subscribe to. I just wanted to share this one thing from this newsletter. And, and let's go through this. The top paragraph reads, most investors do not appear to appreciate the potentially massive implications of the Fed's operating loss, which we just discussed, for U.S. inflation and risk asset prices described above, which are as follows. Fed prints two to 300 billion annually. It hands it to the banks to pay them not to lend. So basically, the banks in the U.S. have deposits at the U.S. Fed. Because the F Fed pays interest on those deposit deposits, it has to pay the banks and print new money to do that in the order of two to $300 billion 
to pay out the interest it owes the banks for these deposits that are on deposit at the Fed. So it's saying, you know, Luke's saying it hands two to three hundred billion dollars to the banks to pay them not to lend to have this money on deposit at the Fed. The banks get that two to three hundred billion. And what do they do with it? They buy U.S. treasuries and mortgage backed securities. And if they buy U.S. treasuries, that makes more demand for U.S. treasuries. And what does that do? It lowers the yield or lowers the rates on the treasuries. It brings down yields. And he goes to the next paragraph here. It says, in bold for emphasis, this is effectively two to $300 billion per year in Fed quantitative easing via the U.S. banks. Because now the U.S. banks are getting this money and they're buying U.S. treasuries. With the U.S. CPI inflation, just like here in Canada, still elevated, the Fed's shift to an operating loss is effectively a pivot of sorts. What he's saying here is that because they're losing money they actually have to print new money, give it to the commercial banks, which, who are then going to use it to likely buy bonds, which is effectively like the Fed doing quantitative easing through the commercial banks. This is going to potentially lower rates. The irony of the situation is delicious. The more the Fed hikes rates from here, the more printed money it will inject into the banking system, which may use that money to buy U.S. treasuries, also known as quantitative easing. You can't make this stuff up. This in turn yields a surprising conclusion. Most roads now appear to lead to inflation, for the moment at least. Fed rate hike pause equals inflationary. Fed raises rates faster equals inflationary. Fed cuts rates to ease operating losses equals inflationary. All the different scenarios point to more inflation. And this is obviously just, you know, him kind of what's the term, maybe like spitballing or just throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks. He's just kind of thinking out loud, but it also got us thinking like, holy smokes, Bank of Canada is in the same situation. The Bank of Canada always copies what the U.S. does. And typically we do more of what the U.S. does because we want to keep our Canadian dollar lower in value because we're an export-based economy than the U.S. dollar. So we want to make our exports exports look cheap. So does this imply Canada is in the same kind of situation? And does in some weird way, higher and higher rates mean more money printed, requi- printing required to pay the banks on those interest rates, on the deposits that they have at the Bank of Canada that leads to a quantitative easing type effect here in Canada as well. Like it's absolutely fascinating. This is the state of the economy that we're in. And this is why I think we all need to be uh, paying attention to a possible debt spiral in this monetary system where the debt gets so out of control because all the money printing that's required to keep this game going that we you know, end up unintentionally blowing up the economy. And if you want the best description of what a debt spiral looks like in simple terms, Google James Lavish, there's his name right there. On August 21st, he put out this newsletter. It's publicly available. I put the f- full URL down here for you so you can track it down. Or if you just Google his name and what's a debt spiral, read this. It'll probably take you 10 to 15 minutes. It's the best explanation of a debt spiral that we've ever come across. So it's definitely time. I feel to understand some of these concepts. So when we see the Bank of Canada delivering a half point rate increase and they're signaling the end of a, you know, their campaign on rate increases, it's just so confusing on to what, you know, do you believe them? Is that really the end? Does inflation stay high, higher than the Bank of Canada expects because of energy and war going on? So does that give them reason to increase rates further more than even they think they're going to? Where are we here? And, and no one really knows. We'll do our best to kind of keep sharing updates. But what we're looking at for the Canadian real estate market is that about mid-February to mid-March is we should get some key insights into what the spring market's going to look like. Usually by that, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. By that time frame, we have some ideas on what listing levels are going to look like, what people are listing their properties for, how buyers are acting. We're going to have a little bit more certainty on interest rates. So right around that time frame here in Canada, we should have a pretty good idea of where this market goes. Because right now it's a standoff in Canada. Buyers really aren't budging. Sellers aren't really budging. I mean, there's a little bit of panic, especially perhaps in the condo market and the assignment market and the condo market. But in the regular resale market, it is a little bit of a standoff. So by this time, we should know, does it inflect one way or another way? And we'll obviously keep everybody updated. In the meantime, stay strong out there. Most importantly, stay liquid. Have access to liquid cash for your own expenses during times like this when rates are going up. It's important. So hopefully you found that 
you know, a little interesting or useful in some capacity. We love sharing this information. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, go on YouTube, hit the red button, subscribe. And until next time, your life, your terms. Thank you.